Good evening, and welcome back to the Thought Leaders Lecture Series brought to you by Space Center Houston and sponsored by UTMB Health. I'm Dr. Deborah Jones, Senior Vice President and Dean of the School of Nursing at UTMB. Tonight, we explore NASA's spacecraft Dragonfly and its planned mission to Titan, Saturn's largest moon. We will be hearing why it is important to go to Titan, how NASA plans to get there, and what we hope to learn. The mission has the potential to help us better understand the origins of Earth, and as one NASA official put it, it could revolutionize what we know about life in the universe. But revolutionary discoveries are nothing new to NASA. The past two decades of research aboard the International Space Station have added to our understanding of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, cancer, cardiology, drug development, microgravity and its impact on the human body, and the treatment of osteoporosis. As a medical professional and an educator, I am extremely grateful for the work and the discoveries being made by our NASA colleagues. As they look to the skies, they inspire my students in the classroom and improve the health here on Earth. I know you share my enthusiasm to learn more about the planned mission to Titan and the promise it holds for our future. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hello, I'm William T. Harris, President and CEO of Space Center Houston, a dynamic science and space exploration learning destination and nonprofit science center. We also have the privilege of serving as the official visitor center for NASA Johnson Space Center. We share the story of human space exploration past, present, and future with more than 1.25 million visitors annually from around the world. Thank you for joining Space Center Houston's Thought Leader Series program, Dragonfly, an overview of NASA's mission to Saturn's moon, presented by the University of Texas Medical Branch. Our Thought Leader Series brings you space and science experts from across the country who provide insights and perspectives on space exploration. Space Center Houston offers robust learning experiences that enable you to be part of NASA's mission. In addition to our extensive collections, you experience new exhibits and live programming, so there's always something new. We invite you to be part of what's happening now in human space exploration. Our spring exhibit, Popnology, explores how pop culture influences innovation. You'll see displays from iconic films of their time, like Alien, E.T., and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Popnology is open now through May 1st, 2022. NASA continues to explore our solar system and will launch the Dragonfly mission in the coming years to explore Saturn's largest moon, Titan. A rotorcraft lander named Dragonfly, which is best described to be a type of drone the size of a Mars rover, will explore dozens of locations across the icy world, sampling and measuring the composition of Saturn's largest moon. Our conversation today will focus on the Dragonfly mission. How will the vehicle get there? How will it do its work and what will be involved? What we do hope is that you'll learn something about the building blocks of life through this mission. We'll find out today during our conversation. I'm delighted to welcome our panelists for Dragonfly, an overview of NASA's mission to Saturn's moon presented by UTMB. Our first panelist is Dragonfly Principal Investigator Elizabeth Zibby Turtle with John Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, or APL. Dr. Turtle is a planetary scientist at the John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Her research combines remote sensing observations and modeling of geological structures and their implications for planetary surfaces, interiors, their evolution, including impact cratering and tectonics on satellites and terrestrial planets and lakes and seasonal weather on Titan. She is the principal investigator for the Dragonfly New Frontiers mission to Titan principal investigator for the Europa Imaging System on Europa Clipper, and participated in the Galileo, Cassini, and Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter missions. She earned a PhD in Planetary Sciences from the University of Arizona and a Bachelor of Science in Physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT. Dave Beaker is a Lockheed Martin Program Manager for NASA's Dragonfly mission under its New Frontiers program. He also supports NASA's Europa Clipper mission. Previously, he successfully designed, led, and executed various hardware and systems in support of NASA's Mars Science Laboratory, Juno, Mars Atmosphere, and Volatile Evolution, MAVEN, Interior Exploration Using Seismic Investigations, and Mars 2020 Missions, so many interesting programs. Through these roles, he developed extensive experience in engineering spacecraft structures, mechanisms, solar arrays, and entry systems. 
Dave has earned multiple NASA Achievement and Lockheed Martin Innovation, Teamwork, and NOVA awards for his leadership in flight technical applications. Our third presenter is Ralph Lorenz, who has worked as a mission architect since 2006 at the John Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, where his activities have centered on Titan, Cassini, Huggins, and future missions. Previously, he was an engineer for the European Space Agency on the design of the Huggins probe to Saturn's moon, Titan, and a planetary scientist at the University of Arizona. His interests include Mars, Venus, dust devils, sand dunes, planetary atmospheres and landscapes, and aerospace systems. He is associated with NASA's InSight mission, the Japanese Venus Climate Orbiter, Akatsuki, and is the mission architect for Dragonfly, NASA's New Frontiers mission, a motorcraft lander for Titan. He's also the author, co-author of nine books, including Titan Unveiled, Spinning Flight, Exploring Planetary Climate and Space Systems Failures, as well as over 300 journal publications. Welcome to all of you. Our panelists will now provide more information about their backgrounds and the scope of their work. Then we'll get into our conversation and we'll begin with Zibby Turtle. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be speaking with you virtually about the Dragonfly mission. Uh, as um, as most planetary missions, Dragonfly uh, is the uh, the work of a large team of people. Hundreds of people around the around the world are working on the the Dragonfly mission. This is uh, the group of us, or of some of us, at our team meeting last fall, as we were pleased to be able to start to have at least partially in person meetings. We had a hybrid meeting. The work I'm going to be presenting is reflective of this uh, the work of this large team of of people. Why do we want to go to Titan? We don't know how life came to form on Earth, and it's difficult to study the history, the prebiotic, the prebiological history here on Earth because everything's overprinted by biology. So places elsewhere in our solar system provide clues about the processes that may have eventually led to life here on Earth. And in many ways, Titan is most like the early Earth, especially in terms of its chemistry. So we looked at Titan to uh, find pieces to the puzzle of the uh, chemical origins of life here on Earth. So Titan is the largest of Saturn's 62 moons, and it stands out here in this, uh, in this graphic, uh, not only because it's larger than the other moons in the Saturnian system, but also because of its atmosphere. Titan is unique among the Saturnian satellites, but also among the satellites in the solar system in that it has a dense atmosphere. And this atmosphere is actually different not only from the satellites, but it's actually different from most of the planets as well. And so Titan is shown here to scale with other uh, bodies in our solar system. It's actually between Mercury and Mars in size, but its atmosphere is denser than Earth's atmosphere. So it's actually the second densest atmosphere in the solar system of the bodies with solid surfaces with uh, atmospheric pressure about one and a half times that of the atmospheric pressure here on Earth. So we have explored Titan with a number of spacecraft. The Voyager spacecraft flew by and showed us several decades ago Titan's atmosphere and the Cassini spacecraft peered through that atmosphere to map out the surface and revealed the presence of a deep interior liquid water ocean. So Titan, like many of the icy moons in the solar system, is actually an ocean world. And the next slide shows the Cassini spacecraft and the Huygens probe. These were two missions designed to study the Saturnian system and Titan itself. Cassini was an orbiter at Saturn and among its uh, many uh, many scientific discoveries was mapping the surface of the moon Titan. And the next slide shows the map of the surface of Titan in the near infrared. And so what we're seeing in this enhanced color view is that there are different materials uh, across the surface of Titan. But what we don't know from Cassini is the detailed compositions of these materials. And that's what we want to study with the Dragonfly mission. Cassini carried with it the Huygens probe built by ESA, and this probe was designed to descend down through the atmosphere to make measurements of the atmosphere itself 
and to uh, send back observations of Titan surface. And indeed, this view here is the view of uh, Titan surface that Huygens sent back from its landing site near the equator on Titan. And you can see to scale our moon on the far right there, giving a sense of the, the scale of the features that Huygens imaged on the surface of Titan. So Titan has all of the key ingredients we know to be necessary for life, certainly life as we know it. There's energy, and this energy drives photochemical reactions in Titan's atmosphere, the uh, result of which is uh, complex carbon molecules, organic molecules that fall out through the atmosphere, make the atmosphere quite hazy, which is why the, the early images show the atmosphere and not the surface. And this material falls out onto the surface where it's had the opportunity to mix with liquids, both liquid water when the crust the icy crust of the moon is melted by impact cratering or perhaps by cryovolcanism, but also liquid methane. Titan's atmosphere has methane in it that plays the role that water does here on Earth. So Titan has methane clouds and rain and lakes and, and seas even. Uh, so the liquid methane on Titan could potentially provide uh, the opportunity for exotic biological systems. So what we want to do with Dragonfly is to uh, look for answers to fundamental questions. Uh, what makes a planet, or in this case, a moon habitable? What are the chemical processes that led to the development of life? And even has life developed elsewhere in our solar system? Now, Titan is very different from Earth in terms of temperature out at Saturn's orbit. The surface temperature at Titan is quite cold, 94 Kelvin or negative 290 Fahrenheit. Um, so we don't know, so, so life as we know it uh, would certainly not be comfortable under these conditions, and we don't have any uh, knowledge that, that life has developed uh, on Titan or elsewhere in the solar system. Um, but uh, we would be remiss if we didn't uh, make measurements to, uh, to understand how far this chemistry uh, on Titan has been able to progress uh, toward uh, biology. And Dragonfly takes advantage of Titan's atmosphere to travel from place to place. We know from the Cassini mapping of the surface of Titan that there are a lot of different environments, different geological settings, and we want to explore the compositions of the materials in these different environments to understand how far organic synthesis can have progressed in an environment we know has the key ingredients for life. But because Titan has this dense atmosphere, we can actually fly from place to place rather than drive. And so that's why Dragonfly is designed as an octocopter to, uh, to take advantage of the Titan environment to travel across the surface to explore different areas. The Dragonfly science objectives focus on the prebiotic chemistry that has occurred on Titan and putting that into the context of Titan's uh, methane cycle, the transport and mixing of organics on the surface, the opportunities for those organics to mix with liquid water, especially, and searching for the for possible chemical biosignatures. And to do this, we have a suite of instruments, a mass spectrometer that will measure the detailed composition of materials sampled from its surface by two drills. There's a meteorology and geophysical package that will monitor Titan's weather and listen for Titan quakes. We have a suite of cameras that will allow us to image at a variety of scales, including doing aerial imaging during flight. And we have a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer to also measure aspects of the surface chemistry. And Dave and Ralph will be talking more about how Dragonfly will be exploring Titan and making these measurements. That is just fascinating. I have so many questions for you. I can't wait for our conversation piece. Thank you so much, Zibi. Next, we're going to hear more about uh, this fascinating project from Dave. Yeah, my, my area of interest is how are you going to get to Titan? How do we get out there? So the spacecraft for Dragonfly consists of three major elements. It consists of a cruise stage, uh, an entry vehicle, which is basically two different elements combined. You have the aero shell, and then you have that, that rotor craft that Zibi highlighted. The cruise stage main purpose is to fly or control the spacecraft all the way out to Titan. So it holds the propulsion system, it holds the sun sensors, the star trackers, some telecom, as well as some thermal radiators that we use to help manage and maintain the temperatures within the spacecraft. 
It also has the dual role of protecting the aero shell and the lander from the sun as we do our close passes. And so if you look closely, you'll notice that the cruise stage is the same outer diameter as that entry vehicle at four and a half meters. The entry vehicle, as I mentioned, is there's basically two main elements that you're looking at there. You're looking at an aero shell and you're looking at a lander. The aero shell's main purpose is to allow that vehicle to pass through the atmosphere, especially the upper atmosphere of Titan as you enter in hypersonically. It protects it from the high pressure, the high heating, and that ablative process that happens as we approach and go through the upper atmosphere at hypersonic speeds. Once through the atmosphere, the aeroshell then separates and allows the lander to be exposed. We'll then, uh, we call it posing, we'll then pose the lander down below the aeroshell and it'll fly off the bottom of the aeroshell. So each has its own function overall as it's cruising out to Titan and we'll go into the next uh, area here to talk through that. So how long does it take to get to Titan? Well, it's taking us approximately eight years from once we launch and separate from the launch vehicle, we'll cruise on out about eight years out to Titan. Once we release from the launch vehicle, we will be spinning and spin stabilized on our cruise out to Titan. Spin stabilization for this spacecraft is important. If you notice, it kind of looks like a wheel where it's got a lot of that outer diameter and the mass out there with a short pancakey type look to it. And that's important to have those inertial properties. That allows us to be spin stabilized and utilize a lot less energy all the way out to Titan. And when you have an eight year cruise, you can think about how much energy you would consume if you wanted to, to control that stabilization without allowing it to spin or allow it to move. So we take advantage of the spin. It allows us to be stabilized as we go on out. For that eight year cruise, the spacecraft will go in and out of hibernation modes to conserve power. Well, we'll basically put it into hibernation, cruise for several months. We'll wake everything up, make sure everything is good, make sure the temperatures are all good. We'll talk back to the earth. We'll confirm where we're at, what our points along the trajectory are, make any corrections along the way, then we'll go back to hibernation mode. We'll go through that all the way through the uh, cruise period. Right before we get to Titan, we'll jettison the cruise stage from the aero shell. And then that aero shell and entry vehicle will enter through the atmosphere, as I mentioned, and it'll protect that vehicle. This is gonna enter, uh, enter Titan or reach Titan in a similar season that Huygens was at Titan. And so we have good analogs from what Huygens brought to us and the information they gave us with Cassini and Huygens that we can apply to this mission, which helps us as we plan out our, our uh, mechanical design, our entry dynamics, as well as our flight plans, because we have an analog for the season and the environment that we'll be in. So how, how do we figure out where we're going to go? Well, Ralph's going to go into talking specifically about the landing ellipse and, and how we find out the best places to land on Titan. But as I mentioned, Huygens specifically gave us great information and, and Cassini as well gave us great information about Titan and allows us to kind of pinpoint areas of interest and areas of focus. And so as we plan and look to areas that we can land on, that also ties into how we design the aeroshell and, and how we're going to protect things getting down the surface. It also drives the, the design of the lander or the, the octocopter. What does its travel distance have to be? What are its flight mechanics have to be? And as Zibi mentioned, we take advantage of the high density or the increased density that Titan offers, as well as the lower gravity than Earth. And that combination allows us to fly greater distances and utilize a rotorcraft spacecraft. Landing on Titan is tough. With the Dragonfly mission, like our Mars missions, we're doing a direct entry landing for this mission. And what that means is instead of going into an orbit, circling the planet several times, and then looking for your entry, we're going to go for a direct trajectory that enters directly in the atmosphere. So after we separate from the cruise stage, it'll we'll align ourselves to where we want to enter in the planet. It'll enter in and autonomously go all the way through the atmosphere. After it passes through peak heating and peak pressure, the pilot parachute will deploy. It's still going supersonic speeds at this point, and the pilot parachute will help stabilize the overall aeroshell and that entry vehicle, decelerating it as well. It'll decelerate naturally just due to the increase in density, uh, atmospheric density as it uh, descends down. As it continues to slow down, the main parachute will be deployed and the pilot parachute will actually draw the main parachute out of the top of the aeroshell, further decelerating the entry vehicle. 
after we are subsonic in our speed and we have descended low enough uh, through that atmosphere, we'll then release the heat shield because we're well past any peak pressure and peak heating at that point. As I mentioned, we'll pose the lander down and basically what we're doing is we're moving the lander down so that the rotors are below the back shell, the back half of the aeroshell. This allows us to spin up the rotors, stabilize the vehicle, and then fly off the bottom. And I turn it over to Ralph to talk more about what we're going to do once we get onto the surface of Titan. Great, Dave. Thank you so much. Absolutely fascinating. It's always remarkable to me that it's probably easier to find a needle in a haystack than to get a small vehicle like this onto the surface of a planet that's so far away from Earth. Next, we'll hear from Ralph, and then we'll get into our conversation. Yeah, well, after the, the epic uh, journey through space and the hypersonic entry and all the drama of the parachutes, that's when the fun really starts and we uh, fly uh, with um, with Dragonfly's rotors uh, to its first landing. Dragonfly has been a really fun project to work on because there has been nothing anything like it before. Um, the, the vehicle that you can see on the slide, you know, as um, looks the way it does because it needs to do certain things and, and those things have not been done before. So big picture, it's like a, like a drone. It's got rotors on the corners and you differentially throttle them to, to tilt and, and fly in a chosen direction. But you know we are a billion miles from Earth and we have to get any data, any pictures uh, from Titan uh, to the Earth without the benefit of any, any relay satellites or anything like that. So we have a, a big uh, antenna, uh, kind of a dish uh, on the roof that we, we fold flat for, for when we're flying but on the, on the ground, we'll aim at the Earth uh, as it moves through Titan's sky. Uh, Titan uh, rotates very slowly, once every um, uh, 16 Earth days. So we'll have a, a period when we can communicate with the Earth and uh, send up commands and, um, and receive the, the data. The vehicle uh, has a, a drill on each uh, skid in order to take the surface material to bring it inside to to analyze it, you know, when you want to drill, you want to put lots of weight on the drill. And that's something that doesn't usually happen on a, a helicopter, right? There's some very, very interesting tensions in the different uh, design factors uh, that uh, influence the, the vehicle you see. It's not very pointy, right? It's not very uh, streamlined looking. We'll improve that as the design gets refined, but because the vehicle has to fit inside the aeroshell, you know, it, there are constraints on how slender we can make it. So it has a, a somewhat blunt nose because it, it's got to fit inside the protective shell. And just so you have a sense of scale, uh, the rotor blades of uh, Dragonfly are about, um, about 1.4 meters uh, across and Zippy's there for, uh, for scale. So what, what you have to do in, in planning a mission like this is kind of transport yourself mentally to this alien environment to try and anticipate all the different interactions of the, the hardware with the material and the, uh, the temperatures and the other conditions. So the rotor blades are optimized for uh, the uh, denser atmosphere and actually the, the low temperature influences the viscosity of the atmosphere. So actually the rotor blades are a bit more like those used on, on bigger structures on Earth, like uh, wind turbines. The low temperatures would uh, freeze everything eventually on on uh, on Dragonfly if we didn't have a way to keep warm. And uh, one of the the best ways of of doing that uh, and providing electrical power is with a, a radioisotope power source. Uh, it's just like the system used on the Perseverance and Curiosity rovers. But it's really critical for us that we get the the, the heat from uh, this system uh, as well as the power. The Electrical power is only about 100 watts, about you know, enough to run a light bulb or two, um, but we, we get a lot more than that uh, in the form of heat uh, from the vehicle. And we keep that inside, uh, inside thick insulation. Um, we have to figure out what uh, strength the winds are. That affects how precisely we can land. We have to design the cameras to accommodate the light levels on Titan. Right? Titan is 10 times further from the sun than is the Earth, so the light levels are a lot lower. I mean, it's still a lot brighter than moonlight, for example, but you have to take that into account in designing the exposure times of the camera. And it's a moving vehicle, it's flying, so you know exposure times trade off against vibration and things like that. We 
we have to design the drill and the sampling system for how hard or how sticky we think the surface material is. There's a you know a lot to lot to take into account. But as Dave noted, you know we have the Cassini and Huygens data to to build on. So you know there's enough material uh, information in 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 those results to to fill several textbooks that have uh, been written since. And there's a, a popular version here. So the way Dragonfly will work exploits the 16 day day night cycle on Titan. 100 watts of output from the uh, radioisotope source is not enough to fly. In fact, it's not, a, not enough to do a lot. So what we do for the entire Titan night, you know, eight Earth days, is just trickle charge a big battery. I mean, it's, it's you know, comparable with the size of batteries used in uh, electric, uh, electric cars. Um, and we use that, um, that stored energy to fly for maybe half an hour. Uh, and that will take us um, several kilometers to a new site. Uh, and we'll um, uh, you know, take pictures of the new site. We'll decide whether we want to uh, sample the surface material. We radio that data back to the Earth. We'll think about it. Uh, and then when the sun sets on Titan, um, the vehicle will be out of contact for, for eight days and it'll just recharge. It'll be doing passive measurements, you know, looking at the weather, uh, listening for, for Titan quakes. But basically it will be uh, hibernating for, for that period. So this is actually quite a nice cadence for science planning. Uh, it's not like the Mars missions, which are on a sort of 24 and three quarter hour cycle, which uh, basically gives everyone jet lag as they have to uh, work uh, uh, through the, the marching uh, days and nights. Uh, we basically have a, a week of, uh, of intense activity and then have a week off uh, to you know, cogitate on the data and decide the plans for the, for the next day. So we will land uh, in amongst uh, sand dunes is the expectation. The radar image at the, at the left is about uh, 100 kilometers, 60, 60 miles across. And these dark streaks in the radar image are, are what we think are organic sand dunes. There's a terrestrial radar image of, of sand dunes in the, uh, in the top center and how that location looks on site. Um, uh, you know, one of the great fun things about Titan exploration is looking for places on Earth that have been shaped by the same geological processes because we can use uh, that, that sort of in situ ground truth uh, to understand what the remote sensing data are, are telling us. And then the on the right is kind of a zoom out showing a crater uh, self that you saw in the earlier pictures. And this is a particularly interesting place scientifically because the impact cratering event we think has driven some particularly interesting chemistry involving uh, liquid water when the crater formed. Craters tend to be rugged, so the crater isn't maybe where we would choose to go straight away. We'll land at the dunes first, where we we believe there's lots of flat areas uh, for the vehicle to land safely in, and then we can scout around. Uh, of course, we can't um, control the vehicle in real time because Titan is a billion miles away. It takes radio signals an hour to get there and an hour to come back. So the vehicle has to be autonomous in the sense of flying itself straight and level, but we'll tell it where to go. And in fact, after that very first landing, after we pop out of the, the parachute um, and, and land where Dragonfly finds a, a safe spot among the dunes, uh, we can um, actually scout out future landing sites by flying over them. We have sensors, a, a LIDAR and cameras to check check what the terrain is like. Uh, we can scout out new places and then fly back to where we took off from. And then we can take off, fly out to a third, go beyond the, that second spot, and then come back to the second if we like it. And so we can do this sort of two steps forward, one step back uh, kind of leapfrog that lets us kind of progressively explore and means after the first landing, we never need to go anywhere that we haven't fully satisfied ourselves uh, you know, is, is going to be uh, safe and productive. You know, the great feature of mobility is that it lets us uh, sample different kinds of terrain. Um, Titan has a, uh, a very varied landscape as we've seen from the Cassini data and by, um, by being able to explore on, on kilometer and, and tens of kilometer scales, we can really uh, sample the sort of compositional richness of this environment. Uh, we'll also fly a, a profiling flight to look at the structure of the atmosphere to understand the weather a bit better. 
Um, so the the mobility that that the you know, three dimensional flight gives you uh, really um, lets us satisfy our curiosity in a, a whole range of scientific disciplines. So the instrumentation that we have, as it's to be described, uh, we have cameras that look forwards. We have a camera mounted on the the dish that will pan around and make um, panoramas of the landing sites. We have cameras that look down, and even a camera that looks kind of close up at the at the individual sand grains, so we can try and understand where the sand comes from. Uh, we have an instrument that that shoots out uh, neutrons, um, energetic particles, to excite radiation in the surface. And by looking at that radiation, we can tell what the surface is made of before we even decide whether to use the drills or not. So that's kind of a, a novel instrument. As Sibi mentioned, Titan is a, an ocean world. We think there is a liquid water ocean, maybe under a, an ice crust of a 50 or 100 kilometers uh, thick. And one of the ways we'll have to, to measure that thickness is with a seismometer, actually a seismometer uh, contributed by the Japanese Aerospace Agency, JAXA. Um, by the way, the seismic waves kind of bounce uh, through that ice layer. Uh, we can hopefully uh, tell how thick it is. Uh, we'll do a lot of science on the ground uh, and a dragonfly will be sitting on the ground for 99% of the time. You know, it's only flying for, for half an hour or something every, um, perhaps a, once a month. Um, but the pictures we, we take when we're flying, the aerial views will be spectacular. Uh, the bottom right image in this slide is a view um, synthesized from the, the Huygens probe uh, when it descended by parachute. Uh, from a, This is from an altitude of about seven kilometers. So the, the dark streaks there are sand dunes uh, 20 kilometers away. Most of our activity will be a lot closer to the ground, so we'll get a lot more detailed views, but they'll, they'll really be dramatic. So we're, we're hard at work. Launch is still five years away, but there's a lot to figure out and develop between now and then. Uh, we use a lot of computer modeling, of course, computer simulations of the airflow, you know, how the downwash from one of the rotors impinges on uh, the others, uh, you know, how much drag we get at different, uh, different orientations, you know, figuring out how the vision system will be able to autonomously pick out uh, hazards on Titan. A lot of that is, is simulation work. We want to validate, uh, to prove uh, those simulations of aerodynamic performance with uh, with wind tunnel tests, and that's just an example of much laboratory work uh, that goes into developing and testing the instruments. But of course, one of the great um, features of Dragonfly being a, a, a rotorcraft is we can test it fairly faithfully uh, on Earth uh, in in ways that are much harder to do uh, with uh, rocket powered vehicles, for example. So we have a, a half scale um, a drone that we can put the same sensors we're going to use to do the autonomous flight on Dragonfly and, and test them in field environments. And I think we have queued up uh, a video that shows uh, some of those tests uh, in a desert area that maybe looks a lot like uh, Titan will. Thank you so much, Ralph. Fantastic presentation. I have so many questions for all three of you. This is such an exciting project. And um, I think I want to start with, um, I think few people know that Saturn has 62 known moons. And how is it that Saturn, it's believed that Saturn has so many moons and how did they differentiate? And why did Titan become a moon that seems to have these kind of prebiotic elements? I was just there's so many different directions to come at that uh, at that question. It's a wonderful question, right? Uh, people have spent um, 
uh, you know, decades trying to understand the, you know, these systems that we have, the, these planetary systems we have in the outer solar system, right? Each of the giant planets has a, a different uh, set of moons and, and rings. Um, and understanding their their histories and their origins is a is is just fascinating. So most of the moons of Saturn uh, will have formed with Saturn itself out of the protoplanetary nebula, and it is it is believed that Titan uh, originated uh, at that time. That Titan formed um, as as part of Saturn's protoplanetary nebula. The history of Titan's atmosphere is a really important question that that I we don't fully understand at this point. How long has there been an atmosphere? Why, you know, why does Titan have an atmosphere when so many other moons, no other moons, uh, you know, do? Um, there, there's a, a lot of research in that area. In, in general, it seems like Titan's atmosphere uh, has been around for at least uh, hundreds of millions of years, uh, maybe maybe more than a billion years. So uh, a little uh, around a quarter of the age of our solar system. And from a dragonfly perspective, that means that these uh, chemical experiments that we want to understand the results of, where organic material can have mixed with liquid water hundreds of millions of years old, if not you know, over a billion years old, means that Titan has been doing the kinds of experiments uh, chemically regarding the, uh, you know, the, the prebiotic chemistry, these, uh, the origins um, of life here on Earth for a long time. And we can't do these experiments here on Earth because the, uh, the timescales in the laboratory just aren't possible. So, um, so that's what, you know, what we want to do at Titan is to go pick up the results of these experiments. Um, so I've segued a bit in that in that answer, I'm afraid, but really what I wanted to get at is the fact that um, there's a lot, uh, you know, there's a very rich history in the, the Saturnian system and there's a lot more to study there. Um, and the the nature of Titan as this, uh, this very unique uh, destination um, and the age of its atmosphere is, is uh, you know, what gives us such a great opportunity with Dragonfly to, uh, to understand uh, the, the chemistry that has occurred there. So I'm curious, and this may be more of a question for, for Dave, uh, wow, to travel that distance for it to take eight years uh, to get to a moon, we're not talking about a planet, you know, that's a pretty small body, uh, and we know how to do it, obviously, because we have sent rovers to Mars. We have sent Cassini and Cassini Huggins. You know, we've, we've done it. But um, can you adjust the trajectory of the vehicle that's taking Dragonfly? Because what if you're just a little bit off as you're approaching the moon? Is there a way that you can adjust, you know, because there can be factors that could affect it potentially, right? Maybe what if the planet got hit by an asteroid or something that may have affected potentially some of its movement or positioning? Absolutely we can. That's the whole, uh, well, it's one of the main purposes of the propulsion system that's on the cruise stage. So as I mentioned, the spacecraft is spinning or st spin stabilized spacecraft. So we'll spin about two RPMs and that will stabilize us as we fly out there, but nothing's perfect, right? We'll try and get the center of mass right where it should be, but there still is some amount of precision that that's in there, as well as your navigation as you go out there. We we understand, or we think we understand, the gravity of, of the different systems and the things that'll pull on the spacecraft as it travels out there, but there still are course corrections to make along the way. And so part of that, that eight years is, as I said, we'll go into a hibernation to conserve power, but also we'll wake up, we'll evaluate where we are, so we have the star cameras to take pictures and, and navigate ourselves along the way, and we'll make course corrections throughout those eight years, so that not only do we get to Titan when we want to, but we'll also align ourselves so that we're entering Titan where we want to. That is absolutely fascinating. The other thing that you were all sharing, which is interesting, is the, pre the pressure per square inch, right? The atmosphere on Titan and hearing that it has these elements of methane oceans and carbon and volcanic activity, et cetera. So that sounds to me that there is climate and so um, have you began studying the climate of, of, of Titan and how, will, how could that affect the mission, um, especially as 
you know, when you're coming in for a landing, you're coming to a landing, especially when it's a direct. And what if there is a storm happening on, on some portion of, of Titan? Are those factors that you've considered? The, the climate of Titan is is a fascinating subject in its own right. I mean, it's the one of the four main climates in, in the solar system, you know, Mars, Venus uh, uh, and Earth. Uh, and the fact that uh, Titan has um, methane that can condense, that forms clouds and rain and rivers, um, you know, makes it one, you know, perhaps the most interesting apart from our own. Um, we have the advantage of, um, uh, what was it, 13 years of Cassini observations, uh, and we have now quite, quite well calibrated and quite powerful uh, weather prediction models for Titan that um, accurately reproduce where we, where we see the clouds, they're very seasonal actually, uh, and predict the, uh, the pattern of the dunes on the surface. So we believe we understand the, the climate well enough uh, to plan the Dragonfly mission. The, the Huygens uh, profiles give us an estimate of the winds at the same latitude and season the Dragonfly will arrive, um, but we are you know, continuing to, to refine uh, the models and our understanding. And the, you know, within a day of Dragonfly's landing, um, you know, our models will improve so much more because we'll have a, a weather station right there on the surface. Fascinating. Zibi, do you have something to add to that about the weather? Uh, sure. Uh, I was going to say, uh, fortunately, we have the benefit of Cassini's 13 years of observations of Titan from within the Saturnian system. And uh, that time scale spanned almost half of a Saturnian or Titanian year. So when Cassini arrived, it was the equivalent in Titan's year of um, late southern summer. And when the mission ended, it was just after Titan's uh, northern summer solstice. So basically from, uh, say, mid-January to the end of June in Titan's, in Titan's year. Um, so we got to, got to watch the weather over that time frame, and we could see that the weather patterns, the clouds, uh, tended to follow where the sun, uh, where the, um, the, the latitude of the sun um, and so when tight when Cassini arrived, the weather uh, was primarily at Titan's South Pole, and then it progressed northward as we went through the equinox to uh, to northern summer. Uh, when Dragonfly arrives, it will actually be basically one Titan year from the time that uh, that Cassini. Um, arrived in the Saturnian system and when the Huygens probe descended down through Titan's atmosphere to its surface. So we know what the, the weather and the atmosphere at Titan was like at this time in its year. And, um, uh, and we know that the, um, at least in Titan's last year, most of the weather at that time was at the South Pole. And we wouldn't expect to see weather systems, uh, clouds and, and rain near Titan's equator for several years after Dragonfly is scheduled to arrive. That is just fascinating. Just a, one other thing to add actually on that. Yes. Um, so Ralph and Zibi brought up, um, there is a dynamic weather system and that we do have data on that. And that feeds, and, and Ralph highlighted that we have models of that, that too, and that feeds our entry um, analysis and our entry planning. And that's why you see a landing ellipse, not a landing point. So we take in consideration the potential winds, both if they were low or if they're high and, and everything in between, as well as dis, uh, density variation, temperature variation, uh, entry time variations, and all that gets kind of swirl together through Monte Carlo analyses and different entry analyses. And that's how we develop that landing ellipse to say, here's the landing area that we can, can land in. It takes in, as they, as they mentioned, those variables, but also we recognize that it's not gonna be 100% analogous to the day that, that Cassini measured and, and you know, to the day, but it'll be somewhere in that range. And we take all that data together to predict that landing ellipse. That is fascinating. We know there are other factors that can affect the trajectory of this mission. And I'm curious, uh, did you factor in or have to consider solar flares from the sun or cosmic radiation that might be pulsing? Because it's a long journey and there, there can be factors, even though it's very, very tiny ship, you know, going to the vastness of space. Are those uh, points of concern, either solar flares, solar radiation or cosmic radiation? 
Solar flare solar radiation, yes, from a survivability standpoint of the hardware itself. And so we uh, insulate and isolate the hardware and we look at how much, quite frankly, how thick the metal is on it to isolate it from those radiation environments. But from actually pushing the spacecraft, you know, one way or another, um, it's pretty massive, right? We're, we're talking about, uh, you know, a thousand kilograms ish um, in the lander alone. And so once you get all the other bodies together, now a couple thousand kilograms, the solar pressure and those solar winds you're talking about really aren't um, a strong enough energy to really push it one way or the other. But say regardless, as I mentioned earlier, we do do course corrections along the way. So if there is some minute impact, we'll course correct and, and adjust for that as we go real time. Well, I'm curious because uh, you're gonna be passing some other celestial bodies once it, it launches off of Earth. And you were saying how there'll be periods of time when Dragonfly will be uh, in kind of a sleep mode and then wake up again as it's going. Uh, are there plans for it to capture imagery on its way to Titan um, and be able to transmit that information back to Earth? Unfortunately, right now, not presently. So we have no outward looking cameras outside of or mounted to the cruise stage or outside looking on the aeroshell to take any celestial pictures uh, along our cruise out. And uh, I was kind of highlighted earlier with our power source that we have, it, it only it's like a trickle charge, right? We're only trickle charging that battery. And so we're using the, the primary power of that battery to uh, manage the spacecraft itself. And so all that power is utilized for that. Is there a lifespan for Dragonfly that you hope? I know uh, there's a great history of rovers and these other exploratory vehicles that have gone to the celestial bodies going on for years beyond what was anticipated, you know, and I think, of course, in Ingenuity, uh, you know, which is still flying on Mars and sending back data and really helping to support the mission with the Perseverance rover. What, what is the anticipated period of time that Dragonfly will be exploring the surface of Titan? The nominal mission timeline is a little over three years. It's actually 3.3 years from arrival um to the the end of the nominal mission and this is based on the amount of time it will take us to get from anywhere in the landing ellipse that dave mentioned to the areas around the impact crater where we want to be able to acquire samples and uh and study the compositions of the, ma the materials where these organics and liquid water may have had an opportunity to mix uh at the the site of the impact crater it's it's possible that the the mission could last longer the power source will supply will the power source uh will uh continue to supply power after that um dragonfly not only gets power uh from the mmrtg but also heat uh that's the that's you know the primary heat source for the the mission and so as the uh, output from the MMRTG decreases over the the uh, the lifetime of the mission. Eventually, it will stop putting out enough heat uh, for for Dragonfly to keep its interior warm. Uh, but that is a, a several year time scale. So there is uh, there's margin in that uh, three point three year nominal mission. Yeah, and to to piggyback off of there, um, as Zibby said, that's our nominal predicted mission, and we have to design and plan and. Um, challenge ourselves to account for the different variables that could impact the spacecraft. And so you mentioned ingenuity and, and perseverance and Mars sample uh, lander, uh, or sorry, uh, MSL uh, lander. Um, all those different missions, they did the same thing. And, and, and that's kind of the heritage that we all have, have worked in, where we have to design it for to meet our primary objectives, but accounting for these worst case um, environments and, and worst case things. Do they all happen? Probably not, but we still have to account for them. And, and a lot of times we'll take advantage of them not happening, and then we do get a, an extended mission to, to carry on. Fascinating. So I'm curious, what are some of, are you learning lessons from Ingenuity uh, that are helping to inform this? I, I know that uh, Dragonfly is very well developed and the target date for launch is still several years away. Um, is it helping to inform any of your thinking or have there been any I mean, I know that mission is very recent, but have there been any insights from uh, the Ingenuity mission that are helping to refine plans for Dragonfly? So the Ingenuity helicopter is is a quite different vehicle and it's much smaller in scale and it's a true helicopter rather than a, a multi-rotor. 
Um, and of course, it's at Mars, which is a very different environment. Um, but we uh, we are, are reaching out to the, the Ingenuity team. I think some of the most important lessons that we'll be able to learn from their ongoing experience is, is first um, uh, how best to uh, test systems, you know, what 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 testing is, is good enough. Um, and, and also the the operations aspects, uh, you know, uh, the sort of turning around of, you know, you get the images back from the from the air. How do you plan, you know, the next step based on those images? What what tools have been been most productive? So I, it, it, the lessons we learn are, are I think, uh, much more about the process of, of flying a mission than uh, about the vehicle itself. Yeah, and to piggyback on that, Ralph, as well, the differences between Mars and Titan are, are pretty significant. On Mars, we have a super light atmosphere. I mean, 1% of the Earth, right? And so you're trying to fly something in a super, super light atmosphere with, with a lower gravity, 3 eighths of a G uh, or 3 eighths of Earth's gravity. Um, but you look at Titan and Titan has one and a half times the density or, or, or atmospheric pressure than Earth does. So it's got a thicker density and the, the gravity is even lighter. It's one seventh, I believe, uh, on the gravity of Earth. And so things can fly easier, to, to put it in, in simple terms, on Titan than they can on Mars. And so as Ralph you know, illuminated there, it's not necessarily a direct analogous from how they operated their uh, counter-rotating blade you know, helicopter there on Mars to this rotorcraft here on Titan. But there are a lot of analogies across the way, um, and we are sharing kind of information back and forth to understand how did they tackle some of these testing problems? How do they tackle some of their operational problems? Um, and in learning that, that helps give us a leg up. The other side you mentioned on those other programs, there's the helicopter side, but there's also the entry vehicle side. And we do take advantage quite a bit from MSL and uh, Mars 2020 or the Perseverance um, mission, where those are also both four and a half meter aeroshells, similar in size to the Dragonfly aeroshell. And so we can take all of those, those rich lessons that we learned from designing and fabricating those aeroshells, as well as some of our other uh, aeroshells we've designed as well, and roll that all into Dragonfly. And we're so much so we're taking advantage of, for instance, the Genesis uh, geometry of that aeroshell that has previously flown, but, but now it's four and a half meters instead of, you know, 2.1 meters. And so things things are able to grow and we're able to scale things, but, but really try and pull all these lessons learned um, as as well as all the data from those lessons. So we have to repeat any of that that learning that we had from before. Well, I know these missions take decades to conceptualize, plan, and implement, and it's really the career of someone, right, to um, to plan a single mission of this nature. So I know that there there's got to be thinking and planning for the future. So uh, is there thinking or discussion about a future mission to Titan to actually bring samples back to Earth, similar to what was now going to happen on Mars? Well, the wonderful thing about Titan is there's so many possibilities. Um, you can imagine wanting to bring samples back and there, there have been actually some early studies on that now. Um, but you can also imagine wanting to explore the, the seas of liquid methane there at uh, Titan's North Pole which is thousands of kilometers away from Dragonfly. It's too far for, for Dragonfly to get. But, um, but you know, sending a, maybe a Dragonfly vehicle with floats or, or maybe a submarine. You know, there's, there's lots of ideas out there. Uh, but you're right, um, outer solar system exploration is not, um, is not a, a business for those seeking instant gratification. <laughs> and I was um, very fortunate. My first job out of college was, was working for ESA uh, at the very beginning, uh, around about th this phase of the project, uh, the very beginning of the Huygens uh, probe development. So, you know, it was uh, seven years uh, development on the ground and then seven years flying through space before it actually got to do its thing. And I'm I'm very lucky that, you know, I can bring forward some of the, the lessons of that development, uh, you know, to Dragonfly to implement, you know, one Titan year later. Fascinating. Well, I wanted to switch to a more personal side. Many of our viewers of this program are either students or people earlier in their careers, and you all are remarkably accomplished and have incredible insights. How did you get to where you are today? Did you always have a passion for science when you were young? Um, did you always have an interest in space exploration? So I'm, I'm just wondering if you each could just please share your journey to, to get to where you are today. 
Um, I I have indeed always been interested in the planets and the stars and the the sky. My father and grandmother, you know, knew all sorts of things about the you know the the moons and the planets and the um, the constellations. We would go out and look for comets. We would go out and look for meteor showers when I was a kid. So I really did kind of grow up being interested in space and in the the time frame when Voyager was moving out through the solar system. And so one of the things that that uh, uh, taught us among everything we learned from uh, from Voyager's exploration and then subsequently, uh, you know, Galileo and Cassini exploring the outer solar system. One of the things that Voyager's revealed to me was what we didn't know and how many things we thought we knew that once we got to the next destination um, turned out to be turned out to be wrong. There's so much we have to learn about, you know, about our solar system. And we're really just at the doorstep of many of these uh, of many of these worlds. It's uh, it's something that I, I have always been interested in. And I studied science uh, through through high school and uh, physics in college and planetary science in uh, in grad school and have had the great fortune to uh, get to work with, uh, you know, with a number of missions and uh, and now uh, to be working working with uh, with both Dra both Dragonfly and, and Europa and Clipper to uh, keep to uh, keep up that exploration. But one thing I wanted to quickly mention, I, I referred to the team at the beginning of the talk. The Dragonfly team, like most planetary missions, is not just scientists and engineers, right? These teams include all sorts of expertise from management to manufacturing, from writing and communications to art to virtual reality. And so there are many, many pathways to become involved in, you know, in space exploration uh, beyond the um, uh, beyond the the science and engineering that 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 one might see represented here there there are just so many many pathways to become involved in these missions so uh, i i encourage people with interests uh to uh to to pursue those um and uh, and seek out such opportunities great thank you uh, how about you dave yeah my my background is engineering um, i'm doing program management now but but really my my heart and passion is all, all within engineering um I, growing up, I was always taking things apart, not always putting it back together, but but always taking stuff apart to understand how it would run. Um, I can sort of taking my dad's rototiller apart when I was a little kid, and I think it stayed apart even after I graduated college. But I learned a lot in that, in that process. Um, as Zibi talked about, it, it, these missions take all different skill sets, and it's not just you know engineering, not just um, physics or, or, or planetary scientists, it takes it takes all of us. And honestly, as you as I've navigated my career, I've tried to I, I like the breadth approach. So I worked on mechanics for a while to really understand how, how different mechanical systems work. How does mechanisms work? How does structures work? Um, then I did some parachutes for a while because that seemed really interesting in, in a field I hadn't understood well. Um, I've done a bunch of composites and, and all along the way it was to kind of one because I was interested in it. And this field's so broad, it allows you to learn different things along the way. Um, but two, it, as I said, I, I want to understand how things worked, and that's kind of how I entered this area. Um, I did go to school and, and graduate. Both my undergraduate and my master's are both in engineering. Um, you know, I, I like to say it's basically applied physics. I loved physics when I went through physics, but I wanted to get my hands dirty and, and not just have it stay in my head. So um, I went the engineering route, and I haven't looked back. I really loved it the whole time. Um, I've worked with a number of different uh, other disciplines as well, and the the best part that I, I, or my happiest memories from all the different missions that I've worked on is working with all those different individuals because everyone brings their own insights, their own strengths, um, and that makes the entire program, the entire team better. And it really is, makes it magical and, and fun to work these missions. Wonderful, and, and Ralph. Yeah, so you, you've heard from the, you know, the, the lead scientist on the mission and you've, you've heard from an engineer. Um, I, I sort of did a bit of both. My my um, undergraduate degree was in aerospace engineering, but I kind of saw that the scientists would have more fun in the long run after the hardware is built. Um, and, you know, as a kid, I was always throwing paper airplanes around and taking things apart and wondering what, you know, other planetary bodies are like. Um, and, and so I've somehow straddled the, the, the two, two disciplines a bit. And that's what's really fun about, um, about a place like Titan, because it's just so, so rich. 
right? You to understand it, you you need to understand geology, you need to understand meteorology. There's all this fascinating um, organic chemistry going on, and then trying to understand how the engineering systems are going to perform in those environments. I mean, you can see there's gazillions of books behind me because there's just so many different subject areas that that a mission like Dragonfly touches on. Well, the thing I hear from all of you is passion and that you all love what you do. And we always say that to our viewers that follow your passion, follow your interests, and it's good to change paths and pursue things that you find interesting and fascinating. So along those lines, how can our viewers follow all of you or follow this project if they're interested in learning more about Titan and how the project is evolving? Uh, we have a, a website where we are providing information about the project, new releases about uh, activities that we're working on. You know, there's there's a lot to come, although although launch in 2027 sounds a long way away. There's a lot of work going on right now by a whole lot of people as we take each step along the along the way. Uh, Ralph showed some of the the test activities that are going on, and that's that's uh, that's certainly some of what we'll be keeping updated on uh, on the website. Um, and there's also a lot of science research uh, going on um, in parallel, uh, uh, based on the the data we have from Titan and models um, uh, models about Titan. So there's uh, there's a, a lot going on, and we'll certainly be keeping people updated that way. And uh, in your introduction, you you noted I, I've written nine books. Um, I actually have the the tenth coming out this year, which is about um, about ingenuity and dragonfly. You know, just kind of comparing and contrasting uh, the different vehicles and their their different goals and uh, their different environments. Yeah, and something else I would highlight as well, mainly for the college students that are out there um, and interested in aerospace, interested in these missions. Um, APL, Lockheed Martin, you know, a lot of these companies, even NASA, we have internships in the summers. And so I would really recommend they also go out to NASA's webpage, go to Lockheed's webpage, go to uh, APL's webpage, go to the, the different um, uh, programs that you're interested in. And chances are there may be an internship available in the summer that you can apply to. The thing I will say is, is do it early, right? So look at that in, in basically the fall before you want to do that internship. So start looking at it in August, September, October, November, and, and all these positions start coming out in that time span to try and look for that f uh, following summer. But those are great opportunities to have a little snippet and get paid, have a little snippet uh, on a mission and, and work in space and get paid while you're doing it and, and learn and work shoulder to shoulder with, with all these great people. Well, thank you. Thanks, all Dave. That. That's a, oh, I'm sorry, William. I wanted to thank Dave for uh, uh, for mentioning that. Uh, and the website that I referred to does have a, a student opportunities link as well on that uh, on that website. Well, thank you all for that great advice and insights. I have a final question. Then we're getting close to the end of our time. Where will Dragonfly actually be fabricated? <laughs> Has that been determined? Well, wh which part, right? Fa fabrication's a, it's a hard line in the sand. I'll, what I'll say from the macro level. The rotorcraft APL is designing, building, testing, and 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 basically pulling that whole uh, rotorcraft together. Lockheed Martin's doing the aeroshell and the crew stage, and then for the spacecraft level, though, that integration and uh, testing will happen kind of across the United States. Some of it will happen here uh, in Denver at Lockheed Martin, as the lander will come here. We'll do some testing, some integration activities here, and then we'll go out to the Cape where we'll integrate it for the final time put it on the launch vehicle and launch from uh, the Cape at the Kennedy Space Center, I should say. Oh, fantastic. Well, I could keep talking to you guys for much longer, but we've come to the end of our time. Thank you so much for sharing the uh, incredible information about Dragonfly. And I think we want to have you come back in the future as the project continues to develop and we get closer to the date of the launch. So again, thank you so much for part of being part of this fascinating conversation. And please follow Space Center Houston on our social media and check out our other Space Center Houston blog for more information about future programs. Have a great rest of your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.